Awesome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Daria Willis, HCC's new president, and this is our first time hosting uh, a conversation called Conversations from the Couch. I am here with Dr. Conte, an assistant professor of history at Howard Community College, and he just found out like two seconds ago that I've never done this before. So take it easy on both of us. Uh, this is our first time on Instagram Live, but we're so truly excited to talk about Black History Month Absolutely. and just the importance of Black history in um, our community, our daily lives, especially with a lot that's going on and what we're talking about and what we're hearing on TV and in the news and in the media. You know, we just want, kind of want to get into that conversation on African American history and its importance. So before I jump in and start the conversation, Dr. Conte, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and I'm going to do that brown sugar moment, <laughs> tell us about that moment you fell in love with African American history. All right, excellent. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, well, first of all, um, I'll start with how I fell in love with black history first, and that'll kind of explain my uh, academic background. So basically, uh, when I was young, like many of us, unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of exposure to black history. Right? In school, in my K-12 through education, I got a little bit about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, but I didn't really learn too much more. It wasn't until I went to college, in fact, a community college, mm -hmm. uh, Santa Rosa Junior College in California. One summer, I took it upon myself to read a couple of books, and then I started taking black history classes, mm. right? And once I took those black history classes and I was exposed to so many, you know, different stories of struggle, success, um, all of these things that I never heard, it really inspired me to continue on uh, and learn more, right? And when I learned that you could actually continue researching, continue learning, mm -hmm. and then actually teach it and make that your career, mm -hmm. you know, I figured that was the best uh, step for me. So uh, from that point forward, I went to San Diego State University. I studied Africana Studies mm -hmm. um, and History. I was a double major. I went to Temple University in Philadelphia, and I studied um, Africana Studies or African American Studies and received an MA. And then I went to Howard University here in the DMV down right. in uh, D.C. Now, you know I went to FAMU, so I'm going to let you slide on that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, have the, you definitely got the band. You got us beat on the and band. And we have the sure. best homecoming, I will say that. But uh, cool. That's the band. That one is definitely All right, band. I'm going to go to a, a Howard's uh, homecoming this year, and we'll see. Okay, we can, absolutely. <laughs> I recommend it. Um, so then I received my Ph.D. there in... Um, the history of the African diaspora. Okay. Right, and from then, you know, I've been teaching and working in this field for the past about four or five years now. Wonderful. And how long have you been at HCC? Uh, this is actually my second semester, right? Wow. So I just beat you here by one semester. Awesome. Um, this is my second semester here. I'm loving it. The students are excellent. The facilities are great. Uh, but yeah, I'm relatively new as well. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, just to highlight on your story, piggyback on it a little bit, I had the same experience. So growing up in Atlanta, we didn't learn anything outside of the major ones that you hear about. And no shade or nothing against Rosa Parks and Dr. King. They're all wonderful Absolutely. figures. But it wasn't until I got to Florida A&M in the summer, I think of maybe 2005, mm -hmm. where I took um, Dr. David Jackson's class on African American history. Mm -hmm. And we did it from the book, From Slavery to Freedom. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nana, who is our librarian, found the book for us, uh, From Slavery to Freedom. And this was the book, that, the textbook, by Dr. John Hope Franklin that we used. Mm -hmm. And in my original copy at home, I highlighted, I remember highlighting so much because I was just so intrigued with wow, there were other people out there who did something that I had no knowledge about. So it's just really cool that we have a similar experience to that. And But it makes you think and wonder, like, how many other students out there in the country that look like us have that same experience, right? Oh, yeah. You know, and, and especially with the conversations that are happening today um, with critical race theory, and we're seeing this movement across the country where people are upset uh, when, when you talk about Black History Month or just Black History or anything negative, you know, how do you feel about that? Uh, I guess, you know, because when I sit back and think about it, it's facts. Mm -hmm. This is our history. History is a study of people, time, place, people. Right. Um, and it's meant to help us learn from our past so that we don't make those same mistakes in the future. So what are your thoughts on just every, I know I just gave you a big broad question, right? <laughs> no, but 
you know, just thinking about our experiences not having that, and it wasn't until we went to college until we figured out that there's more to this story. It, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, because one of the things that my students have mentioned in classes, both here and in my previous positions, was that they never learned about most of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So that unfortunately, this is still an issue that we face, right? Um, and I think this whole discussion about critical race theory, I have a book about uh, the topic, which I might mention later, uh, but really, it is about history. It's really about teaching real uh, American history, U.S. history, and telling the story and expanding the curriculum to include more black history, mm -hmm. right? And there has always been this pushback against including these stories in the curriculum, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it's something that we, you know, unfortunately, it's a struggle that we are continue that we need to continue to um, pursue and kind of push for more uh, black history in the K through 12 curriculum and also at, at the college level, mm -hmm. right? Because students definitely appreciate it, mm -hmm. right? All of the, my students, as, as I've mentioned before, have mentioned how they really appreciate the class, they really uh, are interested in this topic, mm -hmm. and unfortunately didn't have uh, access to it, you know, in their K through 12 education. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's a very, very, uh, it's a difficult debate, but I think it's an important one to have, right? Because mm -hmm. it is part of American history um, and there's so much to it that we can include. So, so who is your favorite historical character or person that, when you, they just excite you when you think about, you know, African American history or just what we're dealing with today? Who is that one person and why? You know, that's always a tough question, right? Because there's so many great people mm -hmm. uh, in our history. But I think one person, and I actually have a biography of him here, uh, Paul Robeson. Um, this is the artist as revolutionary by Gerald Horn, who's one of the most prolific historians um, in our modern era. Uh, but Paul Robeson is such an important figure because he was uh, he was amazing. He mm -hmm. he went to Rutgers University. Uh, at Rutgers University, he played football um, okay. early in the 20th century. He was an All-American athlete, uh, but then he was also valedictorian at Rutgers. And mm -hmm. after graduating from Rutgers, he went to Columbia Law School, received a law degree, but because of racism at the time, uh, he actually end up, ended up going into acting mm -hmm. and became the most famous actor, um, the most famous black actor, and one of the most famous actors in the world in the early 20th century. Wow. Uh, but the reason why I really appreciate Paul Robeson is because he had all of these accolades, all of this fame, but then he was committed to the civil rights and human rights struggle in the United States, mm -hmm. right? And unfortunately, because of that, you know, he um, lost out on a lot of job opportunities um, and was eventually kind of blacklisted, but he was a major, major figure in early 20th century history. And again, this mm -hmm. is a person who I really didn't even learn about until college. So yeah, uh, that's who I would say. When I think about uh, Mr. Robeson, Robeson, I think about, what's that song? Because he had that really baritone voice, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, never mind. I'm not even going to go there. I'm not even going to try to sing it. Old Man he, River? Yes, Old Man River. Yeah, That's yeah. the one I think about. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, you know, so my favorite historical person or figure is Ella Baker. Oh, absolutely. Like, similar to you, we didn't learn about mm. Ella Baker. And she is one of, in my opinion, one of the most amazing black women in history. Absolutely. Because when you look at the civil rights movement, especially the movement that involved young people mm -hmm. and the sit-ins and things of that nature. She was behind the scenes in each one of them. And mm -hmm. she was like the one who said, go out, do this, training the kids up to, to stand up. I think she worked uh, heavily with SNCC yep. um, mm -hmm. and uh, the SCLC and the, the students who were working with those organizations. And I remember reading um, her book and you know, I thought to myself, she was literally a political nomad. She uh, mm -hmm. she didn't stay in one place. She saw her role as moving through different spaces, encouraging and pushing students to act, which I just thought was amazing. Mm -hmm. So Ella Baker for me, and I agree, it's hard to choose, right? right. Mm -hmm. But for me, she's she's one of the you know she she's she's at the top of that list. Absolutely, she was an amazing organizer. You know, she, like you said, she was behind the scenes in Snake the SCLC, the NAACP, mm -hmm. traveling all across the country, organizing people. Yeah, phenomenal person. Absolutely. And she also worked against uh, some of the issues that we had in and, of, in and of itself within the black community mm -hmm. in the civil rights movement. It was a very paternalistic mm -hmm. 
society and she wanted more women's voices to be mm -hmm. inclusive of that absolutely. so i just love her to death absolutely i do too i agree <laughs> i just love her to that so tell me what is your favorite class that you like to teach um that, that's also a difficult question right? oh because come I, on <laughs> I don't know, it can't be that difficult no <laughs> but no for this one i would say um, I like the modern African history, African American history, right? So mm -hmm. from 1865 to the modern era, uh, this is the class that seems to be the most popular with students, right? Mm -hmm. Students are very interested in this era, and we do get to talk about people like Paul Robeson um, and Ella Baker and, you know, the civil rights, black power movement, the Harlem Renaissance, uh, the black arts movement, mm -hmm. uh, the development of hip hop, mm. you know, jazz music. There's so much uh, rich history in that period that I think... That's probably the period I definitely, uh, if I had to choose one class, that would probably be the class that I would choose. But it's most relatable to students. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about history from 1865 to the present, mm -hmm. that's a huge swath of time Absolutely. That, that you can really use to connect mm -hmm. with your students in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so I think when I taught, I usually taught the survey courses, you know, the usual pre-1865 mm -hmm. and post-1865. But one of the areas that I absolutely, I enjoyed teaching it, but it was a very difficult subject, was the subject of lynchings, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Especially lynching in the American South, and yeah. just the culture and uh, the postcards and the memorabilia that came out of it. And I used to do a project, or, or an activity rather, with my students. And I would have them, because typically if it was a fall class, I'd say, okay, if you went on summer vacation or you did something fun for the summer, Take this, you know, index card and pretend like you're writing a postcard to your family member and tell me what you say. And mm -hmm. then they'd write it and they'd go around the room and share their experiences. And then I would give them sample postcards that were sent around the country after a lynching had taken place. Mm -hmm. Where the actual pictures of those bodies were just hanging. And mm -hmm. the students, like the light bulb went off in that aha moment and they saw the importance of why we still need to teach, you know, mm -hmm. these types of subjects. So thank you for sharing that. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's one of those, I just can't see a world where we don't do it. But earlier when we talked, you said, you know, we've seen this before. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit more about that, where we've seen uh, th this, this drive to erase our history and then the push to bring it back. You were talking about the 1960s yeah. and Reconstruction or well before the 1960s but Reconstruction and so so forth. Yeah absolutely so um, in both my US history class and the African American history class right now we've been discussing the period post Reconstruction mm -hmm. right and the way that Reconstruction was remembered in the United States uh, there was a revisionist period right where they attempted to downplay the brutality of slavery uh, there's what's known as the, law, the myth of the lost cause of the Confederacy. Um, and you see all of these Confederate monuments go up across the country. Textbooks uh, rewrote the history mm -hmm. of slavery and Reconstruction. Uh, and also the film Birth of a Nation, mm -hmm. right, which came out in 1915, uh, which really... And played in the White House. And played in the White House. Mm -hmm. Woodrow Wilson, you know, also um, attended Arlington Cemetery when they opened one of the... Um, when they had an event for one of the... Um, uh, Confederate soldier monuments, mm -hmm. um, but those fil that film and the textbooks really kind of shaped the way people viewed slavery, right? Mm -hmm. And it it wasn't until people like Carter G. Woodson, uh, who founded uh, Negro History Week, which became Black History Month, uh, who founded ASALA, right, mm -hmm. the Association for the Study of initially Negro Life in History and now African American Life in History. They had to push back, beginning in the 1920s. You also mentioned Arturo Sch uh, Schomburg. Uh, they had to push back against this narrative, right? Tell the real story of what happened. Tell the real success and the struggles of African Americans. And then in the 1960s and 70s, with the civil rights and black power movement, you start to see more of a push for the inclusion of black history in colleges, um, in the K through 12 curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, unfortunately, I feel like we're in one of these moments again where it's being contested and there's a, an attempt to kind of rewrite or uh, omit mm -hmm. African-American history um, from the curriculum. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think it is a, a, an ongoing battle. So what will it take then? You know, um, I think about my kids. I have three. And I don't want it for them to be... I don't want for them to you know, experience it like we did. Mm -hmm. When they get to college, they figure out that there are other people out there. 
you know, I, the, in Texas, they're talking about taking slavery out of the textbooks, and mm -hmm. I'm sure there are other places where they're doing this, but, you know, what will it take for us to, to protect the truth mm -hmm. um, and to make sure that we can tell, continue to tell these stories for generations to come? Well, I think, um, you know, you mentioned Texas. I know in Connecticut, uh, they actually just uh, passed legislation to make African-American history mandatory for uh, K through 12 and also uh, Latinx uh, history, mm -hmm. ma a mandatory class that everybody has to take. Um, so I feel like there are attempts to push back and I think an organized concerted effort uh, to really emphasize uh, the importance mm -hmm. of African-American mm -hmm. history, indigenous right. history, Latinx history is necessary right there needs to be a pushback against right. it right just like one of the lessons from history change comes about uh, when people organize and push back right so i would argue that you know organizations like asala uh, that really uh, emphasizes black history and other organizations um, supporting them you know uh, and really just kind of pushing for more of it to be included in the curriculum yeah. K through 12 as well as uh, at the college and university level. Cool, cool. Now, I, I hear you. And so I know we're getting short on time, but you brought some fabulous books. So we'll take a few moments to, why don't you tell us about the books and some suggested readings that we have for our audience. And then maybe if we have time, we'll go to some questions. Excellent. Sounds good. Uh, so I did already mention Gerald Horn again. He has I think over 40 books. Mm -hmm. um, this is the Paul Robeson biography, but definitely anything by Paul Robeson. Uh, this is a book I'm currently reading called uh, Becoming Abolitionist by Derricka Purnell. Uh, this book is kind of almost like a memoir, right? Because she discusses her life growing up uh, working class in St. Louis, but then also uh, a lot of her political organizing around the movement for black lives, mm -hmm. right? So it's a little bit of both. It's very easy to read, very interesting book. I also have uh, A Black Woman's History of the United States mm -hmm. uh, by Dania uh, uh, Ramey Berry and Callie Nicole, Nicole Gross. This actually came out last year during Women's Him History Month in March, uh, but it's an excellent book. Of course, it tells the story of U.S. history, um, primarily focusing on the lives and struggles and, again, success of black women. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, um, since we kind of did mention critical race theory, I thought it was important to include one of the founders of critical race theory, uh, Derek Bell, mm -hmm. um, And We Are Not Yet Saved, or And We Are Not Saved uh, by Derek Bell. Derek Bell was a very influential lawyer who worked at uh, Harvard Law, and he is one of the founders of the idea of critical race theory, which really examines institutional racism, right? And it was founded by people like him, mm -hmm. Kimberly Crenshaw, to really address the issues of inequality within the workplace, um, in education, etc. Okay. Right? Uh, so if you are interested in that topic, I think Derek Bell is an excellent person to begin with. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Conte. It's a, been an awesome discussion. Just A, learning more about you and my journeys of only being on this campus for a month. Mm -hmm. But be being able to share some space with a fellow historian. Absolutely. Um, I feel like, you know, I need to go write a book now or something. <laughs> <laughs> we could do that together. Absolutely. But do we have any questions uh, coming from the group we have at all? One question so far. What are your favorite films about black history? Ooh. I know you guys are uh, literature buffs, but any film recommendations? Hmm. Well, okay, see, this is the thing. One that I have, unless no, you go ahead. Uh, it was important for me when I was young, uh, Malcolm X, or X, I think it was X by Spike Lee. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because although it's not necessarily 100% accurate, as you know, of course, most films are not, mm -hmm. uh, it did inspire me to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And, you know, as I think I mentioned earlier, that was one of the things that kind of led me down this path. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would definitely say that film, you know, Denzel Washington does an excellent yeah. job. Uh, it leaves certain parts out, but hey, you know. Can't it, get everything in right, right. a couple it was, hours. Yeah, if, if we're talking fiction, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name. It's more of a documentary. Oh, goodness. And I can't remember Eyes the name. Eyes on the Prize? Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. See, <laughs> I knew it. This is wonderful. Yes, Eyes on the Prize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Had to watch that one um, in college, sometime in undergrad. Mm -hmm. And... After we watched like one one segment of it, mm -hmm. 
I went out and found every mm -hmm. every piece of that DVD collection, and mm -hmm. I sat back and watched it over and over again. Um, just love oh, Eyes yeah. of the Prize. Me too. Yeah. I, I use it in my class. Right? Awesome. It's an excellent, excellent documentary series, and like you mentioned, there are there's ten of them, and they there begin uh, with um, the lynching of Emmett Till, Brown versus Board of Education, Montgomery bus boycott, and then it goes into the 1980s. So I mm -hmm. always recommend to people uh, Eyes on the Prize. There's 10 episodes. It covers everything from black power, civil rights movement, the 1970s, early 80s. Mm -hmm. Excellent series. If you want actual history, Eyes on the Prize is definitely is the best. Is the way to go. Absolutely. Yeah. And it has those primary source material, the actual videos. Mm -hmm. The interviews, yeah. John Lewis. I mean, mm -hmm. you see just everyone in action. I mean, it was like unreal. So when we saw things like the Capitol riot that happened last year, mm -hmm. no surprise because things like this have happened in the country mm -hmm. for, you know, since time began here, yeah. so yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Anything else we have? Don't have any questions, so remember to submit your questions in the comments, <laughs> and we'll get to addressing them. Well, if we don't have anything else, anything else you want to leave with our group? Any thoughts about with our viewers today on our very first season one, episode one of Conversations Ooh. from the Couch? Oh, we got one. We got one. Uh oh, we got one. Another what, question. What narratives resonate most powerfully with Gen Z? Mm. It's a tough question since I'm a millennial. <laughs> <laughs> right, from a fellow millennial to a millennial. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. You know, I think that would be a question for the students to answer. Like, what do they find most interesting about the history? So maybe, you know, you're not supposed to answer a question with a question, right? right. But maybe I want to throw that back out there to them. What parts of history do they find most interesting? I think, mm -hmm. as we kind of talked about from what I've seen, uh, they are very interested in the modern African-American history, it seems like. The students uh -huh. definitely say they like that topic. And there are certain parts of it. I think uh, students have shown a lot of interest in like the Harlem Renaissance, New Negro period of the uh -huh. 1920s and 30s. Of course, the Civil Rights, Black Power period. Right? Those are at least periods, maybe not narratives, but those periods are the, are the ones that um, seem to kind of resonate with them. So I... Um... I taught hip hop in American history one year. Mm. Don't know if they were Gen Z at the time, but I'd imagine that that would be an interesting um, part of history that they want to hear about. Mm. Um, and what was fascinating about that class that their students told me was they didn't realize all the context that went behind mm -hmm. the story of hip hop and, and, and how that came to be and just the poems that were written and really it's a sense of agency against society as we know it. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's a really good question. I, I, I'm going to ditto what you said, turn that back around to the, uh, the, the, the brave soul that asked the question, because it's a really good question, right? Absolutely. You know, what appeals to you? Because that's the type of information that I think we, from a college perspective, would like to know, mm -hmm. because it would probably fuel what you're doing in the classroom and what I'm doing, you know, as a president and how we support our students in getting the pedagogic or, or, or the pedagogical needs that they'll have, you know, coming up. Yeah, because I actually usually in my my first class, I do ask students, "What are they interested in? Like, mm -hmm. Are what are you taking this class for? Is there any specific topic that you're interested in?" And you know, so if I would have known that this question was coming, I could have looked over the list <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. see what people <laughs> usually say, but. Uh, no, so yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think it's something that we can kind of incorporate yeah. uh, into the, our studies. Yeah. Are you ready for your next questions? They're coming in now. Oh, they're coming oh, in. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Next. Okay. How do we consciously celebrate and honor black history 365 days a year? Mm. Well, I think by joining an, organiza an organization like Asala, right? Mm -hmm. So I, one of the things I kind of want to dispel is the, this myth, right? We hear about Black History Month about, oh, why do we have the shortest month of the year, right? Mm -hmm. But really, in reality, it was Carter G. Woodson chose February because of Frederick Douglass's birthday in this month, also because of Abraham Lincoln's in this, uh, birthday in this month. Um, and so he chose this month, and again, initially it was uh, Negro History Week, mm -hmm. right? So I think he's the perfect example of how to do it, right? right? Of course, he was a historian, so, you know, that became his career. He was a teacher and a writer. Uh, but I think by, you know, actively uh, reading books, uh, going to panel discussions, joining a, an organization, um, I really think that's one of the ways or some of the ways that you can 
you know, celebrate Black History 365. And I also think honoring your past, living 100% who you are, um, not being, a, not conforming to societal standards, um, and being comfortable in your own skin, especially as black people, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, sometimes we'll let the celebrities and what we see in the ads and stuff kind of paint the picture on who we think we need to be. But as a people, I don't think that that's the direction that we need to go. So I agree, you know, read up on your history. Don't let anybody tell you what your history is. You become knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about that. Take a class on it if necessary, but also define, you know, you know make, define who you are um, and live in your truth. Uh, and to me, if you do that, you will honor the spirit of your ancestors, the mm -hmm. spirit of your past, your present and where you're going to go in the future. And you'll do that 365 days a year. Absolutely. All right. Um, okay. The next question, we have a couple more. Um, what do we often get wrong about African American history um, or teaching of it, especially in K through 12? You know, I think it's going to go back to what we talked about earlier. Mm. I think there are other people that we can pay attention to in African American history. Mm -hmm. We love our Dr. King and Rosa Parks. Who else? We said those two. All um, Mary McLeod Bethune, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Right. Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are others that we just aren't thinking of right now. Harriet but Tubman. Mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, all of these folks made tremendous efforts. Um, but there are several more out there and several more unsung heroes mm -hmm. that I think about who deserve space in the curriculum mm -hmm. um, and just like when we talked about Ella Baker or Paul Robeson uh, or Adela Hunt Logan for example or whoever else you can you know think of there are other people who were maybe in the background when Dr. King was out doing mm -hmm. his thing mm -hmm. that were supporting the movement that we could be um, putting in K-12 curriculum Absolutely. what do you think? No I agree I think that's probably the the biggest issue that we face is you know the silencing of certain people or the omission of certain people and, and really even movements right and mm -hmm. I, so I would say probably this is the addition to that the fact that it wasn't just individuals but there were movements True. Right? organizations absolutely right so we mentioned SNCC the SCLC uh, the Black Panther Party the mm -hmm. NAACP all of these different organizations and movements Right. And I think a lot of times we get caught up and this isn't just African American history, but history in general mm -hmm. with focusing on great people. Right. As opposed to the, the movements movement. that Absolutely. kind of produce these great people. So, yeah, I think emphasizing that is, is and maybe important. people who weren't part of official movements, but were just people who, right. yeah, like you say, true, who right? are, part, are part of different organizations rather, mm -hmm. but part of that movement. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. I like it. We've got two music questions, so I'm gonna. Okay. I'm gonna give you a part A, part B. All right. What role does music play in educating students about Black history, and what musical artists are you listening to um, that are pioneers in Black history? Hmm. I know that's your specialty. I'm gonna. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> you talk the class on it. Oh <laughs> uh, no! I'm let you go first. I'm gonna wait. All right. So, what role does music play? I think music is a very key part of black history, right? Because so many genres were created by uh, African Americans, right? So I always incorporate uh, music in different aspects of the class, right? So jazz music during the New Negro Movement, of course we play hip hop, and there was always, you know, there's party music, there's music right. that's just House music, music for music, yep. but then there's also music that has a political message to it, right? Mm -hmm. So in a lot of these eras, what you tend to find is that uh, there are songs that kind of have a meaning and that are tied to these larger struggles and, and these larger narratives of the time. Um, so I think it's imperative to use black music in uh, black history classes uh, because it was such a significant part or it is such a mm -hmm. significant part of the, the story. And it tells a story, mm -hmm. right? Like I remember when the movie uh, Straight Outta Compton came out. Mm -hmm. And I was honestly too young to know the group and everything, but I went and saw the movie. Then I went back and did all my research <laughs> on what they were doing and just the lyrics and what they were talking about. And they were in um, the song F the Police, mm -hmm. right? And I love the police. I just let me put that disclaimer out there. Yeah. 
however, they were talking about experiences mm -hmm. of black men uh, in what is it, Southern California, mm -hmm. and what they had to, to, to deal with, and the racism and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the music has to be a part of it. Right now, I'm listening to just because he came on the Super Bowl again, but I saw Kendrick Lamar oh, yeah. in the All Black, and I just, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I just loved it, right? But mm -hmm. I'm also loving just seeing all of the black artists now mm -hmm. who are out there even if they don't have a message mm -hmm. just to me their presence mm -hmm. is enough because we used to didn't have this level of a presence i mean think about oh what's her name they did a movie on her um nina simone is it nina simone um where they showed how the fbi was targeting her oh i can't remember i think so During maybe the, it was the 60s, her yeah because she, she there was a couple of movies recently around Nina Simone. Right, but the, but just the struggles that they experienced in the mm -hmm. 60s and 70s as artists. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I know that everyone has a struggle, but it's not like it was right, right. back then. So even our artists of today are standing on the shoulders of those who came before them. Absolutely. And they're part of that story and the struggle and just how we continue to experience or the black experience in America, right? Absolutely. Which is American history. Absolutely. Dr. Conte, one of your students is giving you a shout out. Yay. I absolutely loved your class. So I just wanted to give you those props. Oh, thank, um, you. thank you. I just want to let you know that it's 4.30. So okay. maybe we'll, we'll start wrapping up, but maybe one last question. Um, I did see someone ask about if we had any local history classes. Um, I'm not sure if you would know that answer to that. Dr. Conte, would you know? Um, not that I know of. I do know that, um, I think it's Professor Gladden, um, who is an adjunct uh, in the history department. Uh, he did an excellent presentation on local history, uh, Silas Craft and others in the local area. Um, so he might be a person to reach out to. Um, I think I got this right. Gladden, I think is his last name. Excellent presentation last semester. And I do think there is an exhibit um, from his presentation, but unfortunately I don't know where it is at the top, off the top of my head. Um, so maybe this is something that we can post. Yeah, we can later. figure it out and post uh, where where that information is. Yeah, because there is a rich history in this, this in this area. area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet. Any other questions out there for us? Um, boop, boop, boop. This is a this is one to end on. Um, what is your opinion about the many calls for defunding police, and how does that affect the black community? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an interesting question yeah. um, and a complex question. In fact, next month I am going to be doing a, um, a discussion. Shameless plug here. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to have a, a pathway event where I am going to be discussing uh, the abolitionist movement in the 19th century to end slavery and then mm -hmm. this discussion in the movement for black lives, which is actually one of the topics that uh, Durka uh, Purnell uh, mentions in her book and how they're really kind of saying that you know, funds should be shifted to education and housing and other things. So mm -hmm. it's it's been misrepresented in many ways in the media. And so I think it's a, a topic that, you know, should be studied more and really we should dive into it and see what exactly people are saying about it. So, you know, it's one I'm still kind of learning about myself. So, you know, I'll say um, since this is my second presidency uh, and in my first, I was in Everett, Washington, and I have to give them a shout out because, mm -hmm. uh, and, and saying this because I haven't been able to meet our local police chief and things of that nature, but they really had a focus on the community. Mm -hmm. um, and they felt like they were getting a bad rap because of things that were happening outside of, you know, that we saw in the media and the unfortunate events that we experienced not mm -hmm. too long ago. However, you know, they were really intentional about understanding who was in their community, how to best serve them. And, you know, handcuffs isn't the way to do it mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. There are certain instances where you need it and others, nine times out of 10, you don't. Mm -hmm. And so they were one of the few um, police departments in the nation that had gotten this really big grant mm -hmm. to go out and do community policing and just working together with community leaders and not saying that they were perfect, but I really appreciated that approach because I think there needs to be a healthy balance, in my opinion, between the two. So I am certainly um, 
I, I, I want to learn more, like as you say, but I know that we need to do a better job understanding each other. Um, and I think that's the crux of why we're here, right? Mm -hmm. And, and that, this is why we have education or higher educational institutions to help fuel that level of dialogue and to learn and to grow with each other and just and, and be able to critically analyze situations and not just jump on the bandwagon when we hear something and we see it in the media. So that's just my opinion. But great question. Um, and hopefully taking classes from Dr. Conte and others uh, from our fabulous uh, line of professors here at Howard Community College will get you there. So with that, I want to thank you, Dr. Conte, for joining me again for season one, episode one of Conversations from the Couch. Um, and thank you to everyone who logged in with us for our first time. Before you click away, please know that we're going to do episode two, season one, episode two. I'm going to see, keep saying that, right? <laughs> on uh, March 17th at 2.30. And that'll be our next conversation. And I think we're going to focus on Women's History Month, I believe, for that one, uh, because it's March. So uh, until then, I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Dr. Conte, any closing thoughts that you want to impart to our uh, the folks who have joined us virtually today? Uh, I just wanted to thank you for having me. It was a, a great experience. And um, no, I just think living Black History 365 is important. So, uh, you know, definitely take the classes. Um, and thank you for having me again. Yep. And I hope y'all can see this big smile behind my <laughs> mask because we did it. This is our first one. So thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next month.